Welcome to this webinar on Business Development 3.0. My name is Jordan Selleck. I am the CEO and co-founder of 51 Labs. Shout out to Source Scrub, which is our sponsor for this event. Uh, Source Scrub is M&A software for deal origination. Uh, it is a data platform built to empower customers to find, research, and connect with private companies using data to transform the M&A and private company investment industry. Uh, over 75, 79% of their platform is private companies. Uh, use cases include deal origination, market insight, conference intelligence, business development, and much more. Uh, they've partnered with over 250 investors and advisors and have a customer list that speaks volumes. So I, I really want to give a huge shout out to them because you know they, they came in as a sponsor to this very quickly, um, speaking directly with the CEO. And I, and I think that you know, that really speaks to the culture of how they operate. They operate really quickly and they get back. Um, and so we've had, you know, really, really um, happy to have them as a sponsor for this event. You know, I want to provide a little bit of background before introducing the panelists. So I think this is best explained by the story of two different private equity firms. One has B, one doesn't have BD or just treats it as lead gen. The other has BD at the table. They have a seat at the table and views BD as a profit center. One copies and pastes PR Newswire links as a deal announcement on LinkedIn. The other gets 5, 10, 15,000 views a week on LinkedIn for free for all the partners. One has no video. The other has videos that share authentic stories about working with founders. One blast general emails to everyone. The other, the other has granular data and can customize e uh, emails. So I think that this is the era of BD 3.0. And the goal today is to chat about the future of BD and marketing in the M&A community. The marketing angle is just one part of BD 3.0. And that's why I want to get these panelists together. So this is relevant to private equity sponsors, lenders, bankers, law firms, and anyone else who is trying to stay uh, relevant and differentiate themselves. So what I'd like to do now is introduce our panelists. Our first panelist is one of our clients. Uh, Ryan Grand is a principal of deal origination at HKW. The next is Carlos Soto, Carlos Soto, who's a managing director and head of BD for Convest Partners. Next, Heather Madland, who's partner and head of BD for, for Huron Capital. Then Jeremy Holland, who's managing partner of origination for the Riverside Company. And last is Mark Gartner, principal and head of investment development for ClearLight Partners. There we go. What I'd like to do is for each panelist to kind of give a snapshot about what you think the key components of BD 3.0 are. And Mark, would you mind kicking us off? You know, I think it was Socrates who said the beginning of wisdom is the definition of terms. So I'd like to offer at least my definition of, of BD 3.0. There's probably a lot of people tuned in right now who wonder if this is even a thing. Um, so, you know, here is my definition. Uh, BD 3.0 is the era during which new technology, data, and marketing-driven strategies are embraced by private equity to drive differentiated deal flow, emphasis on differentiated. So there you go. Who's going to follow that one up? Jeremy, over to you. That's a pretty tough act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that, that's really well said. It doesn't I, I have didn't... to be a definition. We could just yeah. throw out some general ideas. Yeah, I, I'm not touching the definition. That was perfect. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's really a, a much more fulsome profession and approach, right? So it's it's all of these things. It's being a, a thought leader uh, in the deal community. It's being a thought partner internally and helping your teams not only find deals, find angles to win deals and drive portfolio performance, whether that's through add-on acquisitions um, or helping the, the firm grow uh, through investor relations and other, and other mechanics. And so I think that 3.0 is kind of the all of the above era where you're not just siloed in one particular capacity, but you're called upon to uh, be much more of a Swiss army knife helping the firm in many different ways. Heather, can you talk about maybe what is BD 1.0, 2.0, and then what you think are the, some of the key pieces of 3.0? Yeah, I mean, 1.0 was sort of the creation of the role, so to speak, like what is this? 
I just need to talk to people, maybe gain a little bit of visibility for my firm, tell them what I'm all about and start seeing deal flow. I mean, that position hadn't been created yet. I think 2.0 is sort of the form, like the formation of it almost as um, where I think you started to see a lot more people become, um, you know, have BD roles in various private equity firms. And I think today what we're seeing is we're seeing that it goes beyond just deal origination, like everybody said, but you know, this is a viable career path. I mean, I just got a resume from a guy who's an undergrad and he is targeting BD and private equity as a career path coming out of undergrad. Same with um, an intern we hired coming out of uh, business school. So I think this is what we're seeing. And then, you know, BD 4.0 and beyond is, you know, potentially that seat at the table and sort of what that evolution looks like. And I think we're going to talk a lot about that today. All right. Uh, Carlos Soto and uh, the one who is differentiating himself on this Zoom with an awesome sweater. Tis the season to wear <laughs> badass sweaters like that. Um, <laughs> nice. So yeah, what, do, what are your thoughts? Uh, first, how long have you been doing BD and kind of what are your thoughts on what 3.0 means? Uh, so coming up on 11 years of, of business development, started with the Gores Group who had a real institutional effort to BD um, since, the, since the 90s. <clears throat> You know, I've really seen uh, the industry change, the role change. You know, I was talking to Jeremy and Heather at one point earlier in my career was I wasn't sure where, where it would go. And, and to see now that these are senior roles in organizations where um, you've got folks with a seat at the table who are decision makers in their firm uh, that are driving strategy, not only on the sourcing front, but the firm strategy. Um, so, you know, really seen a development there. You know, for me, 3.0, I think, the market today has never been more competitive and it's also becoming more and more efficient. And, and so professionals like the folks here and the folks listening in who are in this role really need to focus on, on how they can differentiate their firm and, and how they're going about that strategy. Um, you know, relationships are the core tenant of business development, right? There's nothing that will ever replace development, uh, re replace relationships. But I think what you're seeing is a way to utilize data um, to further those relationships, to help drive sourcing strategy, internal strategy. And, and so, you know, as you add on to that, it's, it's everything's about efficiency, efficiency with time. How do you spend your time? And, and where we really use data and where you're, I think you're starting to use it is, is how do you be, be most efficient with your time and apply that to relationships? So let's maybe break this down into three parts. The first part of this conversation is really externally facing, BD and external marketing. The second part is internal. You know, how are you selling yourselves internally to the firm and how has that evolved? Uh, the last thing is the tech stack. And maybe to kind of kick off the first part about external marketing, what I'd like to do is to share a case study that we did with Ryan. And, you know, I think that would be a good segue for, you know, Ryan to hear how your thoughts have evolved for the 3.0 skill set. So uh, Nicole, would you mind sharing the, the screen for that, please? So this is an example of one of the posts that we did for HKW. Uh, you know, the scope of this is 50 posts for them. We're doing multiple videos. Uh, this is one of the posts that we did for HKW. And for a little bit of background, um, Ryan, can you share you know, what this post is about. Yeah. And, um, you know, to be fair, it's a real story. They didn't just uh, create it out of thin air, but they did help <laughs> me curate it. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think this post goes back to the, the 1.0 to 2.0 to 3.0 discussion. Um, because this post is really about when I was coming in, I really only thought of BD in that 1.0. I didn't realize there was a career path. Um, I, I really, you know, I told Ted when I came in, I'm going to do this for three to five years, and then I'm going to be a transaction guy. And now he makes fun of me for that uh, every day. Um, but, uh, but that's kind of the genesis of it was, you know, let's find a story about what's somewhat interesting. And also the fact that, you know, I'm not uh, the most bubbly outgoing type that we put in there. Um, and, and there's still a, a place for someone like me in deal sourcing. So, um, you know, that was kind of the thesis was let's find some interesting story angle um, and, and kind of send it out there on, on LinkedIn. 
And, and Ryan, before we kind of kicked off working together a couple months ago, like what was, what would you say your view and the firm's internal temperature was on <laughs> posting on LinkedIn? <laughs> warm at best. Uh, <laughs> so it's, um, it's been a big, uh, but it's been a big step. I mean, my post alone, as we, we show at the top, I mean, I kept seeing these, these views roll in, sending Jordan, you know, for 50,000 views. He's like, well, that is truly viral in our industry. Um, and then I started getting deal inbounds as well. So, you know, it's, it's direct correlation um, to, you know, this digital marketing strategy is already paying off. And I think, uh, you know, when the results come in, you get a lot of backers pretty quickly. So, well, let's maybe shift this over to the broader discussion about external marketing. And we can go ahead and go back to the full panel view here. So I'd like to kind of ask the panel, what do you think the future is for 3.0 in terms of external marketing and BD? And some of the things to think about are conferences. What's the future? When things return back to normal and travel, are you going to be going to the same, less conferences, more conferences? Can you talk about panels, maybe video marketing, websites, SEO and paid search, podcasts? You know, those are more marketing, but also like to, for you to talk about more BD focused uh, ideas as well. Um, let's have Heather kick us off. Yeah. So, I mean, look, I think, you know, BD has always been about gaining visibility for your firm, which is critical and always will be, especially given how crowded and competitive our market is. You know, today it's about, you know, humanizing and personalizing your firm and however you choose to do that. And so I say however you choose to do that because I think there is a proceed with caution to all of this marketing activity. I mean, we're using marketing to differentiate ourselves. Whether that be intermarketing, printed marketing collateral, which still exists and is really a thing, to your digital marketing strategy and your cutting edge um, digital social media strategies, like it's all about differentiation. My I guess I'll add some commentary around proceed with caution. I think a lot of, like there are some firms and depending on the culture of those firms, investment professionals and other people just don't really want that type of publicity. And so I think, you know, there's a fine line between, um, between you know, focusing on individual members of your firm and maybe it feeling a little bit too hokey, but I think that's a little bit of our job to influence the strategy and the direction of our firms and to say, look, this is what other people are doing. And if we haven't done it already, now is the time. And to answer your other question, we're all online. And I don't think that, I mean, I think now more than ever before, this is where people can really shine as thought leaders. We have more opportunities to be talking about our industry, talking about M&A, talking about deals in our firms, because it's easy. You can do a podcast, a webinar, and I hope, and I think, that is not going to go away when the pandemic is over. I do think our, our industry found technology, virtual technology, and, you know, and, and I think there's going to be a nice balance between how we leverage that for our you know, boots on the ground and off the ground activity. And I think that will shift. Um, and, and I guess one more thing I'm going to say, and it's a little bit self-serving, Jordan, so apologize, but, but Jeremy will appreciate this too. You know, I think there's also an evolution in our industry that we have a little bit of a PR problem in general as middle market PE. Um, and, you know, I think increasingly business owners are skepti skeptical of selling to private equity. And, you know, ACG public policy is now gone. And in place of that, AIC, which is the lobbying group for the large, big, big private equity firms, has, has formed the middle market alliance. And Huron and Riverside are members of that alliance. But but just as easy, it's to like educate and develop programming and content for the middle market. So DC hears that there's a difference. And I just, I know that's self-serving, but if anyone's interested in learning more, Jamie and I have information on it. That, no, that, that brings up a couple of points. Um, one on your earlier point, which is you should look at LinkedIn content in three ways. First, industry posts. Let's talk about trends in whatever industries you're covering, something that's interesting. Number two are company posts, a fund closing, a deal announcement, a new hire. And the third are personal posts. What people lack in our industry is a third thing. But let's think about all three categories. Yeah. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. So you work six months on a deal and you copy and paste PR Newswire, that's bad content. That sucks. It's boring. It's not memorable. 
you can do something that is more interesting. You can shoot content about, I worked six months on this deal. And let me tell you about why we invested in this fitness franchises. Because you know, I've lost 75 pounds in the past five years. And that's why I care so much about this industry. Now that video, when you send that to sellers privately, when you post something that's compliant and interesting on LinkedIn, that brands bankers, that brands sellers, that brands everyone in our ecosystem. And humanizes um, us. And humanizes. Because part of, with the in increasing commoditization of capital, you have to differentiate, or as Jeremy was saying, angles in every way you possibly can. Um, and Heather, you're kind of bringing up another point about the PR angle, the public perspective here, is that there is this image, and if you don't control the narrative, other people will. So you have to do something. This is the era of semi-private equity. So um, Mark, I'd like to maybe turn over to you. Actually, Jeremy, since she kind of partially threw you under the bus, I mean, maybe, <laughs> didn't, maybe just called you out. Um, Jeremy, tur <laughs> turned over to you on kind of what yeah. your thoughts are I on think media and marketing. It's the era of earned attention. I think if you look at what Mark's doing with his blog is a good example, where you are driving home specialization uh, in your whether it's an industry focus or a uh, you know a specific type of investment structure, it's your differentiation. There are now so many firms. It's really important to communicate why you're different, uh, and and to get beyond what we do, EBITDA X to Y, this kind of industry, and and start explaining how we do it is really important, it, not only for your firm, but for the industry, how we grow these companies, how we help them hire uh, a sales staff, how we help them navigate this current dislocation we're in and start sharing more of that content of, of what we do every day. And that's going to earn you the right kind of attention as opposed to email marketing, which is more just kind of uh, an annoyance at this point, or you're pinging somebody constantly. Instead, people are choosing to go to Mark's blog. They're choosing to go to your vlog and consume this content on their time or, or to LinkedIn. It's different when the person has chosen to allocate this time to consuming this kind of content as opposed to the email approach, which interrupts their workflow. For many people that don't have the discipline to turn off Outlook, it's they find it disruptive. And so we, we need to be a lot more proactive and thoughtful about how we approach the role. So that brings up another really good point, and I'll turn over to you, Mark, after this, which is <clears throat> I think this generation of firms and BD professionals, it's no the mentality almost has to be what VC, the VC community does really well is add value in content, in resources. Like your top 10 concerns in working with a private equity firm, put that on the website. Like, here's what you need to know. Like, we'd love to work for you. Well, work with you and partner with you, but here's what you need to know in talking to other firms, things like that and adding value to the market. Uh, Mark, I am so excited to have you here because like your, your, your blog posts are legit. You put a lot of thought into them. You are truly a thought leader in the industry with your long form posts on, uh, on Clearlight Partners. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that started and maybe some of the results that you've seen? Yeah, no, thanks Jordan. Um, I had this epiphany one day that I really was a net content consumer, meaning I was spending all of my time consuming other people's content, not focusing on my own. And so then I wanted to start experimenting with that. And I saw a quote by a guy named uh, John Lasseter, who I believe is the former chief creative officer of Pixar. And he said, quality is the best business plan. And there's a lot of digital noise being secreted on LinkedIn that people kind of waste time on. I think the goal is to put out stuff that's good. And so if you work with agencies, particularly agencies that have not worked with private equity historically, they want to put you on a content calendar and it's more about volume. You can't have to be in front of everybody. My approach has been to wait for inspiration. And I know that makes me a little bit more of an artist, you know, than a professional, I suppose, but you know, wait for the topic that you have to write about that really affects you viscerally. And that's made all the difference. And what's really interesting right now is that the bar is so low for private equity content. You know, if you spend time, we're all smart people, you know, on this panel right now, you'll be rewarded. People will take the time and invest the energy to read your information and then even reach out to you, which is why you're doing all this in the first place. And not to mention the SEO reward. Um, like I said, the bar is so low. We found, um, not to give too much away here, if there's a topic we want to rank for in Google, we're on the first page. And so it's been really rewarding to see how some of this content creation has resonated with 
um, the audiences we care about, which is, as you said, Jordan, general industry. So that could be intermediaries, that could be other private equity funds. Um, that could be business owners generically. We have sections on things like how to value a private company, trying to be an education resource to business owners. And then there's the very specific industry pieces we do that are kind of a dovetail of the theses that we're developing that talk about, hey, this is in granularity, how we're looking at your industry and what we are looking for. And we are always seeing differentiated deal flow when we take the time to do that, you know, while we're taking the risk of putting our investment theses out on the internet, but it's only been a positive. What are your thoughts around that content and turning it into video, either long form or micro clips? Because I mean, there's so much quality thought. So like your long form, let's say you have four parts of that blog post, turn it into four micro pieces that's distributed to supplement and drive traffic. I think it's a great idea. From my experience, the video snippets play very well on LinkedIn. Um, The benefit of video is it's a passive medium, meaning video kind of happens to you. And so people really like consuming video. It's harder to sit down and read a long form blog. So a lot of people will view the video and people really Mm -hmm. like it. And yeah, if if you write a long form blog that plays really well, the video snippets are the gift to keep on giving. Chop it up into four or five pieces and, and use it that way. But again, all under the banner of quality is the best business plan. Keep it so, short and simple. <laughs> so I think this is bringing up a really key takeaway here, which is um, don't judge what your audience wants. Let them judge. So that means create different types of content and experiment. So some people might want really long form. Some people might want uh, short stories in LinkedIn posts. Some people might want long form uh, videos or short form videos. They might want long or short emails, like do that experimentation. But I think the key takeaway that people can act on here is do a long form piece of content and then you repurpose that in different ways, video, podcasts. So we can shoot like Jeremy and I shot a full length vlog. So we had a video and we chopped that up into three pieces for micro video. And then we did an article and then we did a podcast from that one 30 minute session. So I think that's an interesting takeaway and how what you can do with content and don't judge too much what your audience wants throw it out there to the ether and then let and get feedback yeah look i think i think as well in this kind of new covid world that we're living in it's going to become more and more important because there's just more limited interaction between people right and, and so most of us who are road warriors here you know we built our reputation and our brand of our company on personal interaction because it's memorable right if i can spend four hours on the golf course with somebody. Those are memorable interactions. A drink at the bar. Those are the types of things. And it, it's, it's harder to do now when you're back to back on Zoom calls or, or calls all day. And so I think, you know, videos, they're, they're, they're just easy to consume as Mark was saying, but they're more memorable. And, and I think you're also not only seeing them and Jordan, you know, I called you to talk about this discussion, you know, cause this is something I've been thinking about that we need to move to as a firm going forward, but you're starting to see these when, when investment banks are marketing processes. Now the first page of, of, of the in, investor memorandum is a video, right. Of the CEO speaking about the company. Um, and right off the bat, it, it draws you into what is this opportunity and, and what is this company more than, you know, an income statement and a balance sheet, right. Or, or, or an investment thesis. And so, you know, the effectiveness of, of video, I think it's become more and more important, not only because we all consume information differently these days. I mean, I'm not a big social media guy, but, you know, I'm on Instagram and, and now that they've made these, you know, stories or whatever they call them, like the TikTok videos, I mean, I can watch, I won't tell you how long I watch them. Carlos, that brings up a good point in terms of, in, in terms of the, the, the video, um, which is you as an individual might think very differently from the firm in terms of culture and how you want to do your job and, and market the firm. So my, my suggestion is if you have that discovery process is do something yourself that is obviously compliant and marketing signs off for just do one video because once the firm sees that, the lights will go on. I'm like, oh, that's what it can do. I never thought about telling our story this way. You know what? We should send something out for our LP meetings. In our quarterly updates, we should do video interviews. We should have our CEOs doing it. And that's just LP facing. Well, what can we do externally facing? Because all of that cumulatively adds up to be different and to be memorable. Jeremy, what, what are your thoughts on, you know, this, on either video or just kind of other stuff? Like, 
research driven well, approach or some of the other topics? Yeah, it, it, it's, I think it's more broad. You touched on panels and, and things earlier. It's really, one of my colleagues uses the phrase, extend the experience a lot. So you just use the video example, but if you're going to invest your time to drive to a location and sit on a panel and what have you, there's two different mindsets. There's people that feel like they have to do it and they're zipping in and zipping out. They're literally looking at, can, is there an exit side door so they don't have to stop and talk to people afterward? And then there's those of us who lean into these opportunities and say, we get to do it. We line up meetings at the venue beforehand. And afterward, we purposely come off stage and sit and answer all the questions. And you extend that experience. And if you're going to invest the time in any of these functions, maximize the value of it and, and embrace the fact that these people have also invested their time to come talk to you and are interested in what you have to say. You're really kind of shortchanging the scenario. I was on a, a webinar recently and the person refused to fix their camera angle or lighting uh, where the moderator kept asking them to do it. And I'm scratching my head thinking, if you didn't want to do this, why are you doing, why are you doing it? it? You know, lean all in to this profession. You, this is a distinct role in the industry and you enjoy it or you don't. If you, if you don't, there's a whole lot of people out there that are, are willing to step up and, and pursue the role wholeheartedly and, and um, across all these different functions. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, Jeremy, you bring up a good point. We have to curate our Zoom experiences accordingly. So Carlos has a wonderful picture by his daughter. Uh, that's actually my work, but. I have a plan from Gretchen Perkins in my background. So we all know if it dies, I'm in really big trouble, but you can all attest it's alive and well. So that, that brings up a really good point in terms of the curation. When you're doing these Zoom webinars, like, Charlie, Charlie Ray, who's our creative strategist, like he's also an actor, plays guitar. We want him on meetings. Cause what, you don't expect that, like a random two minute guitar song to the beginning of your meeting, or do you have a QR code in your virtual background so you can scan it on meetings? Does your background look like trash or does it look like you've upgraded in the past nine months during COVID? Um, so like, this is, this is part of the new normal. Like this is not going away once we get vaccines and everything. This is gonna be the new normal. Um, so before we move on to the next section, what I wanna talk about, or what I wanna throw out there are, are some things that I really respect in the market. Like my goal here is to add value to everyone on this call. And some of the things that I really respect in the market, um, they're not on this call, they're not clients, but I respect what they do is uh, on, I went to TriVest website. They have a chat bot. Um, Mark, I don't know if you have a chat bot on yours as well, but that's what VC firms do. You go to their website and say, Hey, I'm Jordan. I'm a you know head of business development at you know 51 Capital. You know, are you thinking about selling your business, or how can I be helpful? By the way, here are three tools, and then you have all that campaign that follows them afterwards. So that's something I really like about their website. Um, also, you talked about SEO, Mark, but the, and there's also the paid search. If you type in private equity, guess who is at the top of that for paid search? Trivest. And so I think this is going into that skill set. Like, how do private equity firms? now need to be thinking about SEO, paid search. Do we just stick on LinkedIn? Do we go to Facebook? Do we do Instagram? How do we make it so it's not super creepy when you get tracked by Facebook? I'll, I'll say like Live Oak Bank, I get their ads on Facebook and they're appropriate for that channel and for me as a business owner. Um, so I think these are some of the questions to be thinking about. In terms of podcasts, go ahead. Just one thing, Jordan, I, I think there's a lot of things, a lot of tools that you just referenced that the private equity industry has resisted historically because they feel like it's off brand. You know, that's something operating companies do. That's not something we do. But now we're realizing it can be effective. And so I really tip my hat to the innovators out there who have adopted things like that. You know, in our website, in the top right hand corner, there's a little button that says get in touch. And then that prompts a contact form submission. I really wrestled with do I even put that on there? You know, is that consistent with private equity's brand? And it's just kind of funny to think about. And then you put it on there and people start using it. Mm -hmm. So all of these things I think are very useful tools that private equity is starting to embrace because they work. Yeah, and I think the websites are just starting to upgrade in terms of the old 2.0 websites of the last generation was the stale, here's the about. It has a picture of a guy in a suit and that's really cool. And then we have investment criteria because that's really cool. And then, but what about all the other stuff? Like what about the stories of their CEOs, like in video, not just a written testimony, like 
seeing them hear and speak of working with you. Um, Carlos, what were you going to say? Sorry, just to add to, to what Mark was saying about being off-brand, I think the other thing that private equity struggled with, especially when it comes to sourcing and investing and sourcing and marketing, is return on investment, right? And, and you see that in firms that they say they want a business development function, but they won't hire somebody who's senior or you know, they're, they're concerned about how those dollars are spent because it's hard for them to really identify what the return on investment, what the length of time will be on that return of investment. And that's changed. That's what's really changed, I think, from kind of 1.0 to 2.0 to 3.0, as, as we're talking here today, as firms now see that, you know, this is a function that is, is essential now. And, and, you know, Mark, who does a great job of marketing and, and a lot of us here, you know, with the, maybe the exception of Jeremy, who, who might have more dedicated, more marketing resources, right? Being a bigger firm, but not, not a knock on Jeremy, just, just by function of size and, and length of time in the market. You know, we don't all have dedicated marketing you know, professionals that work alongside business development. So we're trying to figure that out as well. And, and you know, Heather will test, I've called Heather for advice on how do we do marketing better before. And I think when you use TriVest as an example, I'm sure it's an example that's come up in a lot of firms. They're doing it very well. They've invested in, in you know, a dedicated marketing professional there alongside of their business development team to really drive that forward. So, you know, I do think that they're, you know, that is something that you'll see more of in private equity. Yeah, and it's leveraging those third-party resources accordingly or bringing it in-house like Jeremy and Riverside have done. But I do think that's like critical today. And I think creativity as a skill set for BD was never something we talked about. And all of a sudden it's like, wait, how do, is this person creative? Can they do X, Y, Z? I mean, it's a completely different skill set we are looking for. Now. That's, the fact, that's where private equity is going. You know, you, you've got now dedicated BD pros uh, is a full career path as we've talked about the same way that there's dedicated investment uh, relations professionals eventually you will realize that uh, as the firm scale there will be dedicated marketing separate from bd mm -hmm. once you reach a certain point i can tell you our marketing team has taught me so much that i i, I can't even begin to scratch the surface as a topic for another day um, but it's really great. I'm not naturally a creative person, but they are. And it's really great to, to see what you, what you can do. But uh, in the regular firm environment, you certainly, you know, if there were only an outsourced firm that could help me, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but that, this brings up a, a, an interesting point, which is the need to experiment. A lot of times when we're doing a project, we'll do like a phase one where it's full LinkedIn, full video, but then we'll get through that first three months and then the firm will say, hey, we'll take over LinkedIn, but keep on doing our video. By the way, our AGM is in a month. Can you do six videos for us in six states for six portfolio companies? Other firms say, you know what? We don't really need anything for video. We just want to focus on LinkedIn and getting the basics on that. And so I think that the key takeaway here applies to everyone, which is experiment. And you know that really goes back to 51 Labs. Like we call it labs because it's about always experimenting in our life personally, with our family, how we're doing things, with our business, how we're doing things. Are we doing it right? What do we need to adjust? Um, the 51 part of it comes from 5149, which means always give more than you receive. And it's taking the long view on relationships. Um, so let's, let's turn over to like the next part of this for the next 20 minutes, which is internal marketing. Some of the questions I think a lot of people have on their minds are, what is the future of BD in firms, in terms of like sourcing, exits, fundraising, how do you earn a seat at the table? How do you manage your personal brand and the firm brand? What advice do you have for firms that hired their first BD person and measuring the success? For people who are that first BD person, how do they measure success? And what advice do you have for the juniors and others who maybe just beginning their careers in BD. So let's start off with, you know, the future of the BD role and who would like to take that first? I would say, so I guess to get, I guess we're kind of going in that direction, get beyond BD. I, th I think what you really have to do first is, is prove the value in the initial role. You know, get that deal flow going, get differentiated deal flow, get looks that you don't think the firm would have otherwise, you know, really prove out the, the base part of why you're there. 
Um, and, and then I think you can kind of focus on where do we go from here? Um, and I think the natural extensions I've found at least, uh, one being exits. Um, so I'm on the exit committee now, which is fairly new, uh, but it ties in because, you know, when we talk about who's going to sell our companies, you know, who's on the phone with these investment bankers all day, it's generally me. So I, I generally have a, a sense of at least who we should talk to. Um, so that's been, you know, one avenue I've expanded my role. And I think fundraising is the other really natural one, just mm-hmm. skill set wise. And also, as we talk about importance of the role increasing, um, you know, the deal flow is the lifeblood of private equity firms, good deal flow. And if you can't express that to your LPs well, um, I think it puts you at a big disadvantage. So I think that's a, a little bit of where I'm, I'm seeing the role going. Let me ask everyone on that point about the lifeblood of the firm and, and deal flow. If you had to guess on a scale of one to 10 of the people that you interact with your colleagues and peer, your peers, what percentage of them do you feel are confident and self-assured like, no, this is really important in the firm and look at the deals. And I, I know what you guys feel about this, but listen, like, here's what I add to the firm. How confident do you feel the average BD and origination professional is about what they do in the firm? I'll say, well, I think it depends on where the firm is on their their journey to 3.0. <laughs> I think if you ask a BD professional at a 1.0 era firm, they might answer that question very differently than someone at 3.0. And the, the sense of intrinsic value increases as you get closer and closer to, to 3.0 level sourcing, in my opinion. So what do you do for someone who's at 2.0? It, they're like, you know what? This person has been here for a couple of years. They are adding a lot of value. And that BD person needs to earn a seat at the table. Yeah. Like, how do they earn a seat at the table? Uh, I mean, I'll, because, Car- or was it Mark that was so good at quoting people? I'll do my own. <laughs> I'll quote Brene Brown. You can have courage or comfort, but you can't have both. And so I think the BD professional that earns a seat at the table has to be very courageous. Guys, we have more market knowledge than most of our investment, actually anyone on the investment team. We're hearing about deals. We have intel about deals. We have relationships with advisors and lenders and other people that could be really important to our portfolio companies. And we can't be afraid to share it internally. And we have to figure out a way to communicate that effectively within your firm and show that you have, you're have you adding value and you have influence cross-functionally. So that's you know creating your own opinion on your firm's strategy, whether that is go to market from a BD perspective or IR from a messaging perspective or capital markets or investing and trends that you're seeing and how to compete and win deals. Like we hear these stories all the time from one another and we have to, you have to figure out a way to talk about it internally and to get your voice heard. And that starts with, with getting more credible, like gaining credibility with the investment team and building that bridge which is BD 2.0. It's seeing the right deal flow and making sure that you're only showing your team what you think is winnable and actionable first and not, not crap. Um, but that's BD 2.0. B- I mean, Ernie, I see the table. Like, so that's, that's my thing. You just got to be creative. So, I mean, one little anecdote, I think, you know, the skill set we need to communicate effectively internally is very different than how we communicate externally. We have a different energy level. We have a different way of talking. When you're having conversations around strategy or important decisions in a inside your firm environment, it's a very different type of communication style. And I actually hired a communications coach a few years ago because I, I I knew that that was something I needed to work on. And that's you know professional development that I spent time focusing on because I knew that it was important to elevating myself um, within Huron. Heather, I love that. Are you saying specifically like the person you are externally facing more energy, that part is different from how you are acting internally, which might be, how does the investment professional behave and act? Yeah. The, I mean, the, look, all the people are doing. I'm laughing. I'm talking. I'm like, you know, anecdotes all over. Like I'm talking about my personal, I mean, when you're internally talking about that, like the investment team doesn't really care. Like that's just noise to them in some ways. And you have to be able to cut out all the noise, which we all like to do in our you know, social environments 
and really focus on the message that you want to deliver and how you want to deliver it based on the information that you have, whether that be data driven or market driven, you know, yeah. or all, you know, all everything. So yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think you have to be a thought leader, right? So if you're a junior professional today and, and you think that you're going to achieve success based on the number of teasers or sims or books, um, that's how you're always going to be evaluated, right? And, and I don't think that's where you're gonna truly add value to your team. I think, you know, understanding that and building credibility that way, um, you know, in this business, there's a lot of big egos, right? And I think the most successful people in this role, um, you know, are pretty low ego, high confidence and, and find a way to, you know, work with really intelligent deal and investment professionals the right way. And what I've really found has, has been probably what I think is a strength is, is, is finding where my strengths are and where our deal professionals weaknesses are and finding the right intersection to truly add value. So not highlighting those. And, and it's not one and the same with every professional that I work with in the firm. Um, and, and so, so, you know, some mid-levels, VPs, principals, who maybe haven't really flexed that sourcing or, or worked out that sourcing muscle because they've been so focused on execution, but in order for them to get to the partner level, have to build that ability to go out and market and build relationships. How can I help develop those professionals within the firm, work with them, get them more involved in what I'm doing. And then, and then really just carry, you know, I always say business development done the right way is a true extension of the deal team. Right? You're not siloed off in some other area of the firm. You are part of the deal team from the beginning of the process to the end of the process. So you have to focus on, I mean, I, I, you'll always hear relationships, whether it's, you know, the, um, I forget, you, the legends or the dinosaurs of business. I can't remember what you call the legends. <laughs> <laughs> Talking smack. All right. I like but, it. You know, you're always going to hear relationships as is so important in this role. And it is, you have to invest and, and relationships take a lot of time, right? If you're on a 30 minute call with somebody and you don't talk about business at all, that's okay, right? That is an investment and maybe the best call you've ever had with that person on the other end of the line. And I've got a ton of relationships that we talk about their kids or their interests. We exchange book reading lists or, or things like that. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's over the long term, and, and that helps because it's not just about me getting my information across of what we do and how we invest. It's about getting information back, and that's what's going to help differentiate you and help your deal teams be more successful, too. Jeremy, yeah, can you talk a little bit about um, how you measure success within your BD team? First, how big is your BD team? Can you talk about the evolution of how you have measured success so that people who might be the first person in their firm to be running BD, what they should think about? Uh, you know, we're a, we're a global firm with nine different fund strategies. So it's a, it's a different constitution. We have uh, 14 in North America, uh, counting senior folks, the analyst associates, um, admin that we call coordinators, uh, as well as uh, colleagues in Europe and Australia working across those products. And, and so it's different because we're decades into this function. We're not talking about sims come review time we're not talking about number of phone calls number of meetings all that's measured of course lps always want to see that kind of data and have it available it's all tracked but at our level we are focused on productivity over activity and so we're going bottom up not top down we're looking at deals closed absence of deals closed lois and absence of lois you could look back to iois but realistically with, with 300 plus Riversiders around the world, you should be closing a handful of deals a year. Um, so that, that's how, how we look at it. Nice. Let's get to some of the questions. Let's kind of answer this in the next 10 minutes. So the first question is, uh, what was the makeup of the deal inbounds, Ryan, that you got of the 15? How many were in the strike zone? How many were add-ons? Can you kind of talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, out of those 15, I would say there are about nine or 10 that were just completely out of bounds, but, you know, nice to hear from you. Just easy. No, um, there were probably five that were worth checking out the teaser and then one to two that we've were reviewing. So, I mean, 
not a not a terrible balance actually for you know one LinkedIn post. So, <laughs> um, cool. So let's go through. Uh, so speaking of marketing, uh, what are the top two or three metrics that each of you are tracking? You know, maybe this is even brought more broadly speaking. What what metrics are you tracking as an individual? It doesn't have to be related to LinkedIn, but in your day to day, your weeks to weeks, how are you tracking? I was just going to say, I think funnel activity is number one, right? People want to understand what is actionable deal flow, what's work being worked on in the middle of the funnel, and how can I help those deals get further down the funnel as well? And so I think we constantly look at funnel stats and actionable deal stats to and 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 also where our deal flow is coming from from a geography perspective so that we can target and customize our bd efforts accordingly so those are kind of a couple areas that we focus on yeah jordan it's a good question i mean when we first started with the digital marketing activity it's easy to get distracted with vanity metrics you know people want to tell you about you know, impressions or views or website traffic. And, and that's all nice. And that's, that is in the funnel continuum. So it's helpful to some degree, but that's not what gets deals done. So I want to see people taking real action, you know, as a result of something that we did action that would not have happened otherwise. Um, and the best is when someone reaches out to you and like in Ryan's case, sends you a deal you wouldn't have seen. And so that's really helpful. I love seeing form submissions on our website. Again, that's still kind of nascent, haven't closed a deal from a form submission. I do think deals will get done that way with the right content. And so I'm holding out hope that that could happen someday. But you know, what sort of real life activity is generated from what you are distributing digitally? I guess, Mark, I have a question for you or other panelists. Like, How important is the engagement on the social media platform? A lot of brands, consumer brands do this and measure it based on engagement, not just how many followers do I have or how many people have viewed something. How important is that to be part of the conversation without, I don't know, compliance coming up, coming after you or saying something that's not politically correct or, you know. It's easy to get distracted, Heather. It's a great question because engagement feels good. You know, the ego responds to engagement. Um, and that's the essence of why social media has really taken over. I mean, you listen to some of the founders of Facebook, they talk about exploiting vulnerabilities in human psychology, getting people to post more, you know, and that's what made it so addictive. You, you can't lose sight of the fact that you're doing it to generate deals. So yes, it's good for brand awareness. Yes, it's good to be part of the conversation, but don't make that your primary focus. You're there to generate deals. And, it's back and deals to quality over scene. quantity. Exactly. <laughs> And one of the kind of notes here in terms of metrics that's important to know for everyone with our particular market on LinkedIn, they often don't like or comment, but they will view. You know, it's not everyone will view. You know, LinkedIn does a test. If you do a post, it goes out to a small percentage of your network. Then it sees how many people in the golden hour reply, like. Then does that content spread outside of your particular network? So it's okay. And I, I, I learned this in the past four years and I have to remind myself, stay consistent, stay quality, stay authentic. Don't worry about the metrics. Yes, they matter, but they're not the primary thing. Just be who you are, be consistent, be quality. And then a year from now, when you fly to a, a, a meeting and someone says, hey, I saw that video that you did six or 12 months ago. That has happened to me for the past four years, and I have to consistently remind myself, like, you've never liked or commented on a single thing I had. You actually watch the videos. So just stay consistent, stay authentic, and be yourself. Great advice. Jeremy, what were you saying? I, I was just going to say, for us, one of the things I like to really hone in on are when we close deals or, or bid on uh, companies from sources we had not previously transacted with. It's easy with a firm like Riverside for someone to assume uh, everyone knows us and we know everyone. That, that kind of 1.0 mindset back when the partners did all the originating themselves. Sure, they, they are aware of a lot of investment bankers at the major investment banks, but it's, it's pretty fun when they say, who is XYZ partners? And on the next one, who who is this firm and who is that firm? But by being regional and going deep and building these relationships locally, we continue to turn up opportunities that the firm you know, would not have otherwise seen. And so there's, there's a multi-level to it. So there's the fishing aspect, but I think what Mark's doing, what other people are doing, it's getting the fish to jump into the boat 
as opposed to us out there knocking on doors all the time. And so it's it's changing that relationship at the same time that we're changing our relationships internally as we add value on exits or, or other ways. Cool. And guys, I want to launch a quick poll about CRM. Somebody asked a question, which is also one of our poll questions. Mm -hmm. So let me go ahead and ask this. You know, what CRM are you using? Salesforce, DealCloud, Dynamo, uh, a wraparound Salesforce platform or other, or none? Do you still use it? Excel or do you using are you using Word? If anyone's using Excel, they're not going to admit it on this. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to do it? Raise your hand. It's fine. <laughs> All right. So it's coming in, coming in. Got 125 votes coming in. We're going to close this in 10 seconds. I won't Just do go the back for one second. Shot clock. Can I go back to the? Uh, yeah, for I sure. One, I think the 1.0 mindset was, you know, go find deals. 2.0 was let's find deals that are a good fit for us and make sure we, we, you know, are ahead of all those. And then 3.0 is how do we know when these deals are coming? How do we, how are we, you know, we have kind of predictive knowledge around, we want to be in this industry, but you know, maybe it's two years away. Let's start talking to these companies now. How do we market to that segment? How do we show expertise? And I think it, that's, that's really what we're, we're gaming for here is, how do we get ahead of everything and, and get those early looks or even, you know, preempt things is, is really the, uh, the holy grail of BD 3.0 for me. Yeah. And Jordan, if you're, if you're looking for topics that go deeper into some of these, I mean, one might be the weaponization of CRM data and how to make that data quasi predictive. And then also the integration of the technology platforms that we're using uh, so that all the data resides kind of, you know, in a, in a central hub with good integrity with that data. Those would be wonderful topics to kind of revisit, in my opinion. And how your process is created within that, mm -hmm. right? And how it changes with how your strategy changes. I think the interesting thing about CRMs too is how you can capture data, right? So we use Salesforce and, and it's, we customized it completely and it's, it's constantly evolving, the information that we capture. Um, in terms of metrics, you know, we use that not only for our sourcing strategy, but we, we analyze our deal flow, where it's coming from. And as I mentioned earlier, that's how we decide where we spend time. I mean, 80% of our deal flow comes from 50 banks, roughly 50 banks, mm -hmm. right? The remaining 20% comes from 70 banks. Now I say, quali I say qualified deal flow. So it has a characteristics where we'll sign an NDA, but we've seen deals from over 450 banks each year, right? So how can I utilize the data that we've captured to say, here's where we're going to spend our time? Right here are our top tier relationships. Here are the next tier that we really want to make top tier relationships and, and drive that further. Here's the group that we think they're very relevant for us, but we really need to 80 20 on how we spend our time. Right. Mm -hmm. So, how can we? And, and so, where we're really thinking through is how do we create content, email blast content that's more directed just to that group, right? That maybe focus more on add ons or you know thought pieces or something specific to some of our portfolio all companies. that goes back to the level of data that you have and are consistently tracking exactly. so, so guys let's go to our last question which is for people who are at the beginning <laughs> of their careers what, you like those answers like yes awesome meh womp womp it's okay if it's a womp womp <laughs> not gonna hurt my feelings mm -hmm. um so can you talk about um the people who are just beginning their professions you know, what advice do you have for them, the associate, the first year, the second year? How can they have an awesome career 10 years down the road? Let's use that as a 60-second answer around the table, and then we'll wrap up. Jeremy? I think start early building your relationships. It's easy in the analyst associate role to get bogged down in the things like entering data and reviewing sims and signing NDAs or what, whatever they've been asked to do. Um, but they need to start building their own network. Keep in mind that the analysts, your peers at the, at the investment banks, the analysts and associates at the investment bank rarely get invited to things. Everyone wants to invite the MD. You as an analyst and associate should begin building the future layer of relationships for your firm because you know we've been around 32 years. We want to be around another 32 years. And candidly, I'm getting too old to call analysts and say, you want to get a beer. They assume I want to hire them, you know, and it's just, it's, there's a disconnect, but the, the younger people on our team can connect very readily with them. And so they, people are surprised we go into meetings and I, I tell our, our investment teams, 
that this banker and I are very good friends and we walk in the door and it's all bro hugs and talking about the kids by name, of course, and whatnot. And they're surprised at how, how do you know this person that well? And I said, I tried to explain to you, we've been friends for 20 years. I went to his wedding, you know, I know his wife kind of thing. You're sounding and, and like a legend, shocked. Jeremy. <laughs> are you on the right? Are you on, you need to be are on you part on the right two. Channel? I'm next not week, sure. next Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mark, he's, but they, uh, they should start early, start early on their own relationships. Don't, don't just be a doer, start building that, that layer in. And I think that goes to the point about being patient. Like you have a long career, you might or might not be in this role, you might or might not be in this position, in this industry, in this firm, take the long view and be patient in, in building that. Uh, Ryan, what's your kind of key takeaway for people who are just starting their careers? Uh, takeaway for people just starting, um, especially in this role, um, I would say you treat every conversation as a gift is how I try to approach it and just say, you know, look at how many people there are in this role. There's 600 of us. We're all trying to call people all day. When someone actually takes your call, you know, treat it seriously. Um, I think that's one of the things I didn't realize was so hard when I started was um, just being on your A game at all times and, and, and really caring. Um, and I think that'll go a long way. I think the founder of some like test prep review is like expect magic in every conversation regardless of who it is, expect magic. And also like giving to the other person and having that mindset, um, I think is really important. Um, Carlos, what's your thought? Uh, you look, for me, it, it comes down to relationships as well as I think what you'll hear. And, and you know, relationships are not transactional, right? It, it, they, you, you have to spend a lot of time building those and you gotta be honest and, and sincere in how you go about developing those relationships. And you got to work with what you have at your firm so, and, and figuring out how to use that. So, you know, we don't have, you know, 50 portfolio companies, you know, like some firms have, like, I think I went on Jeremy's website and I got through the A's and I'm like, they already have more portfolio companies than we <laughs> right? So just work with what you got. So if you're building relationships with investment bankers, you know, be upfront where they have opportunities in the portfolio and then help them understand how to develop better relationships with the deal partners or, or, or what, their, what you would advise their strategy should be if they really want a shot at it. And, and you know, use just, you gotta use what you have to the best of your ability. And, and everyone's playing from different playing fields. So, um, you know, whatever you can do there. Mark? Yeah, I would say in the sense that, you know, your aim should be to decommoditize your firm. You should also decommoditize yourself, uh, make yourself indispensable. And the best way to do that is to produce, of course, differentiated deal flow. And my favorite way to do that, where your personal interests are very much aligned with the firms, is to develop an investment thesis. You've got tons of information coming your way from the market. Use that information to identify a sector that the firm naturally would not have gravitated towards and find deals from that sector. Uh, and that's an irrefutable way to add value in a way that, you know, someone else might not do. And it really helps establish yourself uh, internally. So I'm a big fan of thesis development. Thanks. Heather, taking us home. Yeah. So, I mean, all of that is really important, of course. But I guess here's what I would say to both BD associates and other investment associates, especially in BD, you are the most visible person at your firm. You are re a reflection of your firm's brand. And so how you carry yourself outside of the four walls of your firm or even inside on the phone with a banker is critically important and is a reflection on the firm. Every conversation is an opportunity to market and develop new business and we need to leverage that. That is awesome. Guys, appreciate you so much for taking the time to do this. We might have a part two, or who knows, we'll be, maybe we're discussing BD 4.0. So guys, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us, and we'll get to the questions and send out a summary afterwards with the video and podcast. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks, thanks Jordan. Jordan. See ya. Thank you.